Suriname. Let's talk about the most absurd country in the world. Today we're adding a new piece to the collection of states where I'm not really welcome. But what is this Suriname thing? And most importantly, What's the big deal? Suriname, the smallest state in South America, is covered over 90% by forest, making it one of the least densely populated places on the planet. But don't be fooled, because the Surinamese population around 630,000 souls is perhaps the most diverse in the world. We've got a third of the population coming from India, another third with African descent, and 15% are the offspring of immigrants from the island of Java in Indonesia. There are 20,000 indigenous people including the Arawak and also a good 7% of Chinese. So in Suriname, they celebrate Chinese New Year, they practice Hinduism and Islam, and the other half still is Christian. Definitely a legacy of colonialism. Just like the fact that in Suriname, they mostly speak Dutch, the language of the former colonial power. But the language known and spoken throughout the country is Zranan Tongo, a kind of fusion between English, other European languages, and indigenous idioms. Despite its internationalism, you can't access any other neighboring state from Suriname via land because it's surrounded by two rivers. Geographically, Suriname is almost exclusively inhabited in this strip of land. The rest is an immense, impenetrable Amazon forest. Not to mention that there are only 11 foreign embassies throughout the nation, just a bit more than those found in Pyongyang. So Suriname seems a bit like the Bhutan of South America, a much damper Bhutan that cares little, if at all, about the outside world that birthed it. Such an unusual state obviously must have in its genes characters halfway between madness and made theater. This guy who seems so harmless is Desiree Butersi, or as friends call him, Desi. Nothing but the dictator of Suriname throughout the 80s, and also the president of the country from 2010 to 2020. What happened in those 20 years of blank space? He was indicted for multiple murders and drug trafficking. No wonder last January he went into hiding. This on the other hand is his son Dino, who instead of having a crodino, shows off all his masculinity in morally questionable photos. Like any hero worthy of the name, our Desi has a rival and nemesis of great caliber. We're talking about Ronnie Brunswick, a jack of all trades, because not only is he the current vice president of Suriname, but he's also tycoon of gold mines, a rapper. I tell you, and drug trafficker wanted by Interpol and ex-rebel. Quite an impressive resume. Especially because, back in the 80s, Ronnie founded the Jungle Commando, an armed group that challenged Butersi's Surinamese army in a bloody civil war. In the years following the war, amid shootouts, Ronnie even found time to buy a football team. Inter Moengo Tapo, which plays in the far from self-referential Ronnie Brunswick Stadium, a team for which he also took the field for whopping 54 minutes in 2021, at the age of 60. On that occasion, Brunswick not only self-deployed onto the field, but was also caught on camera handing out banknotes to the opposing team. Did he score 807 goals? Hats off. Ronnie is the new boss of the universe. Anyway, we'll get back to these two who seem like they're stepped out of a Quentin Tarantino movie in a bit. First of all, it would be better to ask ourselves, what is Suriname? Actually, no. Maybe it's better to ask ourselves, why is Suriname? It all begins in the first half of the 1600s, when European powers were seeking new territories in South America to subjugate and turn into nice plantations to ship slaves bought in Africa. Remember our video about sugar? Well, the French occupied present-day French Guyana, while the English seized Burbice, Demerara, and Essequibo, the three regions that now make up Guyana. Between the two colonies, however, there was still a swath of rainforest left to explore, where only the Dutch had managed to briefly establish an outpost, along a river that the locals called Suriname. Actually, that name probably derived from the Surinan, one of the local indigenous ethnic groups related to the Arawak. However, the Sarnan or those indigenous to the land were frankly reluctant to accept the presence of some pale individuals in their land. But necessity is the mother of invention. The man in question is Lord Francis Willoughby, who in 1650 had been chosen by King Charles II as governor of the English colony of Barbados, now an independent state with one of the most spirited flags in the world. Someone had to say something. Anyway, at the time, Charles II was living in exile in Scotland after being ousted from London by Oliver Cromwell's new model army during the only Republican period in English history. What was the problem? 
The problem was that in the past, Lord Willoughby had been an ally of Cromwell, but then betrayed him by siding with King Charles I, father of Charles II, who was beheaded in 1649 by Cromwell's forces. Believing he'd meet the same fate, Lord Willoughby decided to pack up from Barbados and move to a place where he hoped no one would reach him. That forgotten piece of land near the Surname River. So, our Lord outfitted a ship at his own expense with 20 cannons, conquered the local village known as Paramaibo, Maracaibo. Mm, not Maracaibo, that's in Venezuela, and made it the capital of his new personal colony, Willoughby Land. Here, our little lord created about 50 sugarcane plantations, and to work them, he employed both natives and a few thousand slaves imported from Africa. I know, we said Suriname was a Dutch colony with Dutch as the main language. To understand why there's not a shred of English left, we have to stay in the 1600s. But since we're already talking about English, let me introduce you to today's sponsor, Cambly, the leading e-learning platform for online English lessons. Whether you're in Paramaibo with Ronnie Brunswick, in the middle of a soccer game, or you're comfortably at home, far from a villain like Battersea. On its platform, Cambly provides over 10,000 native tutors, available 24-7, accessible via integrated video chat. The plans are completely customizable, lesson duration and frequency, but also how, meaning you can choose between group lessons with other students or solo sessions. Want to understand what Brunswick is saying in English? It's a very special day for you and for the European Maybe he needs it more than you, but the many courses available on the site and the possibility to choose the teacher that best suits your need, maybe based on accent or personality, will help you find continuity in the challenge of improving and perfecting your English. All of this is possible at a discounted price of 55%. Impossible to find anywhere else for this type of thing. By using the code SUPERNOVA, the link in the description, or scanning this QR code, you'll get a 55% discount for your lessons and a 30-minute trial for just one euro. As the colonizer Willoughby once said, the early bird gets the worm. The same goes for starting to learn English. Now back to us. With the comeback of the monarchy in England in 1660, Lord Willoughby returned to his role as governor of the spirited Barbados. A few years later, an English fleet landed in New Amsterdam, a Dutch colony in North America, and took possession of it. The offense, combined with pre-existing disputes over spice trade routes, sparked a conflict between the English and the Dutch which also played out in the Caribbean Sea. It was here that Willoughby met his end, in 1666, when a ship was hit by a hurricane off Guadalupe. At that moment, the Dutch seized the opportunity to forcibly take Willoughby land. The conflict ended in a tie in 1667 with the Treaty of Breda, and both powers agreed to maintain their respective conquests. Willoughby land, now in Dutch hands, became known as Dutch Guyana, but officially it was renamed Suriname. New Amsterdam, on the other hand, changed its name to New York, what is now known as the Big Apple. Mistaken for just any other Suriname. But don't think it was a bad deal back then. Like if in Monopoly, I sold you Park Place for Baltic Avenue. And I assure you, it's a mistake I've made many times. In fact, for 250 years, the Netherlands exploited Suriname both as a commercial outpost and to extensively cultivate sugar, cotton, indigo, and coffee. The inhumanity of the colonial regime led hundreds of slaves to flee and hide in the most unreachable recesses of the jungle. Today, the so-called Maroons, a generic derogatory term for the descendants of rebel slaves, make up about 20% of the Surinamese population. Once slavery was abolished in the mid-1800s, Dutch colonists signed an agreement with the British Raj in India to send contract laborers from Uttar Pradesh to South America. Additionally, at the end of the 1800s, fueled by the growing demand for rubber, the Dutch sent Indonesian laborers to Suriname. Transferred from the colony on the island of Java, and Chinese laborers recruited by the Dutch consulate in Macau. Skipping ahead a century, having become independent in 1975, Suriname finally saw a third of its population, mainly white, emigrate to the Netherlands. The Dutch sure know how to make a mess, huh? And there you have it, the peculiar ethnic composition of Suriname explained. In itself, after independence, multi-ethnicity wasn't a big problem. But this still didn't prevent the emergence of strong social tensions. In 1975, a prominent figure of the afro surinamese community, Henk Aaron, was chosen as Prime Minister due to his efforts in independence. However, the Netherlands chose to keep a close eye on their former colony, appointing the last local governor, Johan Ferrier, as president. The Dutch also promised to provide $1.5 billion until 1985 to support the weak Surinamese economy and establish a national army. 
This last piece of news led many Surinamese military personnel who had moved to the Netherlands to want to return home. Among them was a young non-commissioned officer, our Desi Bowdersey. What could go wrong? In very simple terms, the Dutch aid ended up in a network of corruption supported by Hank Aaron, aimed at favoring the afro surinamese And not content with corruption, Aron Inferior came up with a grand idea, underpaying the officers of the new National Army and preventing them from unionizing. It was at this point that a disillusioned Desi Battersay gathered 15 soldiers and on February 25th, 1980, seized power overthrowing the Aron government. However, this man, Sergeant Major Desi Battersay, overthrew the legitimate government of Suriname in 1980. Once President Ferrier was also removed, his loyalists attempted a counter-coup for a long time. They tried until December 1982, when Battersay, who had become the undisputed leader of the army, had 15 political opponents executed at Fort Zelandia, the old fortress of Paramaibo. Fun fact, the historic center of the Surinamese capital is a UNESCO heritage site. From that moment on, Battersea made enemies with the entire Western world and ruled with an iron fist. Virtually everyone supported him, except for the person who was theoretically closest to him, his bodyguard, Ronnie Brunswick. <laughs> The two were like something out of a poster for the untouchables, but something drove a wedge between them. In 1985, Desi proposed the, quote, democratic reform of the constitution, which would allow him, as head of the army, to influence the decisions of the future government. Ronnie argued that the Maroons, an ethnic group always excluded from national politics, of which he was a part of, were not even considered as part of this reform. So Ronnie decided to rebel against his boss. Or at least, that's what he wanted everyone to believe because in reality, he distanced himself from Bowdersey when the latter refused to give him a pay raise. Oh, isn't that just typical? You work your butt off to protect your employer and this is how you get rewarded? I think this will go down in history as the most pointless cause to spark a civil war. Representing the Maroon cause, Brunswick formed his rebel group, the Jungle Commando, and waged guerrilla warfare against Bowdersey's army, causing hundreds of deaths and displacing at least 10,000 people towards French Guyana. In retaliation, in 1986, Desi had Moyawana, Brunswick's hometown, destroyed and his population massacred. Apparently, Desi follows Hammurabi's code to the letter. How did they resolve this internal conflict? In the end, Battersea managed to push through his beloved constitution, which by the way is the current one, but in the subsequent elections of 1987, the National Democratic Party, his brand new party, achieved the resounding results of three seats out of 51 in parliament. And as president, Ramzawak Shankar, one of his opponents, was elected. Great job, Desi. A swindle that not even a shell game could match, especially now because Desi's hands were tied. But the best was yet to come. In December 1990, returning from a personal trip, Bouderse took a detour to Amsterdam, where the Dutch police prevented him from speaking to the press. Once back home, Desi resigned as an army commander because Shankar, who happened to be on the same flight, had not protested against the Dutch authorities' behavior. As his successor, Desi chose Ivan Granost, who remained in office for a whopping five days. Here comes the improbable stories you've been waiting for. Regretting his resignation, on Christmas Eve at midnight, a bit like Santa Claus, Desi asked Granost to make a phone call to Shankar to tell him that he, Shankar, could consider himself formally dismissed. Merry Christmas, Shankar. Is toch de, ook de man achter deze staatsgreep? Dat uh, geloof ik niet. Het Nationaal Leger heeft vanuit haar structuren aangedrongen op verandering. Heeft een motie ingediend waar de voormalige bevelhebber Desi Bouderse helemaal niet bij betrokken was. Within a few days, that phone call turned into the absurd Surinamese telephone coup. With Battersea, instead of his henchman Granost, returning to power in Suriname. I mean, how can this get any crazier? The 1991 elections handed the presidential seat to another opponent of Battersea, the mathematician Ronald Venetian. Yes, literally Ronald the Venetian. Thanks to him, Ronnie Brunswick laid down his arms, entered politics, and began to take an interest in gold mining. But it was also thanks to him that Suriname gained some international credibility. Venetian governed until 1996, was replaced by one of Bowdersay's henchmen, but held the presidential office again from 2000 to 2010. The autocrat's saga seemed to have finally come to an end, kind of like a sitcom that has been milked dry. 
To get back into the spotlight, Desi was forced to ally with three other parties ahead of the 2010 elections. Elections he won, but to achieve an absolute majority, he had to ally with none other than his rival and favorite bodyguard, Ronnie. In the following 10 years, this reinvented Battersea indulged in introducing free healthcare, minimum wage, and a national pension system, only to then be sentenced to 20 years in prison for the murders of 1982. Which is why he's now a fugitive, but not his only conviction. In fact, since 1999, Desi has been wanted by the Netherlands and Europol for cocaine trafficking in collusion with Colombian drug cartels, the same crime for which Interpol has put a bounty on Ronnie's head. I find it very misleading from the vice president gehackt. But that is not true. But I am sure that I have nothing to do with drugs, no other relation with no other a band from, from drugs and did. To add to that, Battersea was likely the head of the Surrey Cartel, a drug cartel that in the 80s and 90s brought significant amounts of cocaine from Brazil to Europe. Head of state, drug trafficker, fugitive. Great. At this point, you might honestly ask, how on earth is it possible that nobody has ever done anything concrete, even just a small international sanction, you know, to stop what seems to all intents and purposes look like a rogue state? And here's where, it gets fishy. And the fish's name is the mining sector. Dutch colonists stopped caring about the plantations by the end of the 19th century, when they identified gold reserves along the lava river. Not this lava, but this lava. The discovery triggered a real gold rush, just like the old one, leading to the identification of other mining reserves along the Karaka River like bauxite, a mineral used to produce aluminum. The first multinational to take an interest was the American company Alcoa, which operated in Suriname from 1916 to 2016. Another fun fact, Alcoa holds the aluminum monopoly in Iceland, has raised many environmental criticisms with its plants and contributes to 20% of Iceland's exports. So what, let's move on. In Suriname, however, this metallurgical giant Alcoa has exhausted the country's bauxite reserves and built the country's only national hydroelectric plant, which generates at least half of the local electricity. Don't bother looking for who owns the mines, you would only find politicians, friends, or friends of friends of Desi Bowdersay, to whom our gentleman has allocated funds and concessions over time. Together, until a few years ago, gold and bauxite represented 85% of Suriname's total exports, which also included wood and rice, mainly directed towards Switzerland. My name is Brunswick. But with the depletion of bauxite after milking Suriname dry, Alcoa packed its bags. But now there's another resource that will attract foreign investors. Oil. Extracted for the first time in the 80s, Surinamese fuel is under the control of the state company Statsoil, which also manages Rosebell, the country's largest gold mine, along with the Canadian mining giant I Am Gold. In November 2023, the Malaysian giant Petronas discovered a huge offshore oil field, and currently Shell, Total, Chevron, and Exxon are also searching for extraction sites. Nothing prevents Suriname in the near future from replicating the experience of Equatorial Guinea of Theodorin Obian, or that of neighboring Guyana, whose resources, as you'll recall, are at the center of a territorial dispute with Maduro's Venezuela. Oh yeah, Suriname also claims its share of Guyana. Unfortunately, there's no doubt who would pocket all the profits, and maybe at that point we can all take a group photo with Teodoro Biang. At this point, don't forget to watch the video on Equatorial Guinea. The current president of Suriname, the Indo-Surinamese Kan Santoki, is a breath of fresh air. Also because he's the former police chief who managed to pin Bautersi for murder, a bit like Zenigata with Lupin. But let's always remember that to govern our Surinamese, Zenigata has needed, and still needs, the support of a figure like Ronnie Brunswick in a context of rampant corruption. Meanwhile, Desi may have fled to who knows where, but his memory continues to live on with his son Dino, former head of Suriname's anti-terrorism unit, who in 2013 was arrested by the US DEA on charges of drugs and arms trafficking, and attempting to establish a Hezbollah headquarters in Suriname. At this point, I don't know what else to say. When you think you're living in an era full of contradictions, my friends, always remember Suriname, which is going through its own timeline. At the same time, however, Suriname is a bit of a litmus test for our contemporary world, a place nobody cares about until it's time to swoop in and get rich like vultures. I only feel sorry for those 600,000 souls forced to live there, but especially for what is today one of the last green spots on our planet. What's the saying? A healthy mind in a Surinamese body 
Thanks to all of you for listening. Thanks to the sponsor of this video, Cambly. You'll find the link to the offer and the super number code in the description. Bye, Super Brunswick. <laughs> Samsa, 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 Samsa,